Good evening. I'm Dr. Kanisha Zimmerman from Duke University. On behalf of the ABC Science Collaborative, I'm pleased to welcome you to our COVID-19 in the Classroom uh, seminar series. We will focus tonight on school nursing um, and on methods to provide safe care and protect um, everyone during the controlled pandemic. Next slide, please. So just a reminder about our disclosures and next. We are uh, again, very excited to have you join us this evening. We are going to uh, give an initial presentation which will be done by Dr. Ibikun Akinvoyo and then we'll take questions from the comment section um, in the YouTube chat um, that will supplement our presentation with some of your questions. Those that aren't answered during the webinar will actually uh, be combined with additional questions um, and into a frequently asked questions spot on our, um, on our website um, or included in future webinars. Uh, you can access, as usual, our webinar slides and videos at our website um, seen here. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So we um, also recognize um, that many school districts districts have many different resources um, in order to fulfill nursing needs. And so we um, recognize that and want to make sure that this talk is also applicable. Um, things like the school health advisory councils may be helpful um, in applying some of this information that we talked about today. Next slide, please. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Akinboya. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. So we'll, we'll start off just discussing, I think, what a lot of people may already know, but it's worth reminding us about, uh, particularly with the headlines that have come out this week and the fact that we are going to discuss transmission and personal protective equipment uh, during our webinar today. So just talking again about how COVID-19, so SARS-CoV-2 is the virus that causes COVID-19, how COVID-19 is transmitted. So the virus that causes this disease is most often spread through air, but in the context of coughing and sneezing, uh, which means that the droplets that are released when you cough and sneeze can lead to an infection in someone that's close to you. We've often said less than six feet. Um, and the close to you also means close personal contacts, which includes touching and shaking hands, particularly if people are not washing their hands or through touching your nose and mouth and eyes. Um, as we said earlier, in the earlier course of the pandemic, just limits how often you touch your face. The things that work are remembering the three Ws, wear masks, wait six feet away from those that are not in your household and wash your hands. Next slide, please. The reason why this is here is just to remind everyone of this concept of the Swiss cheese model. So nothing by itself is what we need to focus on. They all kind of work together. And the goal here is to prevent COVID-19 transmission. All layers are important because one layer by itself is not perfect. So social versus physical distancing is really more what we're talking about. Uh, wearing a mask, washing hands, or wearing a face covering. Um, and then of course, testing, particularly for those that are symptomatic um, or asymptomatic, but exposed and getting those results fast enough to ensure we can trace contacts. Next slide, please. In the partly understanding transmission um, is also related to understanding symptoms in children. I think the unique thing about COVID-19 and one thing that has been quite difficult to manage is the fact that people can spread including kids can spread this infection even without symptoms. But there are quite a few kids that show up with symptoms. The most common symptoms remain cough and fevers. Not every child will have a fever. Um, some may have fatigue, headache, some soreness, certainly a cough, um, or could have abdominal pain, diarrhea, and nausea. The reasons for these symptoms may vary. It could be related to COVID-19, but as we're entering into influenza season, of course, there are many other viruses that could cause similar symptoms. Um, next slide, please. So the NCDHHS, our state guidance and the Strong, um, Strong Start School Kit incorporates some of the symptoms, not all of them. And it's important to note that it's not all of them that are incorporated into the screening guidance. Um, and it's the Swiss cheese model for a reason. We can screen for some things, but if there are symptoms that may not be here and a child develops symptoms later in the course of the day, it's important to have a plan for that child. But what does this guidance say? Um, if you look, look at the different prongs, so how can we screen for COVID as children show up to school? 
If they have no flags, it could be through an app or in person, they can proceed to school. If they're, ace, if they're exposed but have no symptoms, the preference in this context to ensure they quarantine at home and not come up, um, participate in virtual schooling and not come for in-person schooling. If they are diagnosed, even if they don't have symptoms, they do need to isolate because you can spread the infection. So you should be isolating at home. And if a child has at least one symptom, again, I will just um, talk through the difference in the long list of symptoms we just showed. Here, these are the higher risk symptoms. So fever, chills, shortness of breath, a new cough or new loss of smell and taste. Those have been associated with the COVID-19 diagnosis and um, these children should be screened out and should not be in school, in in-person school. Next slide, please. So switching gears a little bit, where our focus today is not just on the background information, and we only have a couple more slides on background and we'll address questions as they come in. Um, but school nurses, as well as educators um, and our teachers are vastly important in ensuring that kids can be educated safely. In particular, the school nurses help with healthcare services. So kids with chronic health conditions, and you all know this, is just reiterating why it's important to have access to school nursing, even if it's in uh, various forms. So dealing with chronic health conditions, helping with inquiries and managing illnesses, educating about health. And I think during this pandemic of misinformation, um, school nursing has become even more important to educate our students, staff, and teachers on the correct information around COVID-19, helping to inform plans, so both emergency plans and training staff, say, for example, with how to use masks properly, um, and then also assessing health, so not necessarily doing just the screen. I think every school district is coming up with plans to incorporate screening into coming into school in some way, um, but having some standard health assessment um, and ensuring the school environment is safe. So our next slide goes into the detail. Next slide, please. Um, we, this was, this was alluding to kids that may have special needs and may require nursing. So the special needs can cover a vast number of situations in a child. It could be that they need help with feeding. It could be that they have some chronic condition. It could be a developmental delay. But one thing to point out is they may also not be able to consistently comply with mask wearing. Um, or interacting with them may not be done as efficiently if we have our typical cloth face mask. So in those, in those situations, it may be worth considering a mask with a clear panel. We've talked about this in our webinar, um, just trying to talk through speech therapy, for example. Um, it may also be good to use face shields in combination with a surgical mask if the child is unable to wear a mask. And gowns and gloves in the context of school nursing will be needed. Next slide, please. The roles of school nurses uh, remain vast. I talked about some of the general roles. Um, in during the COVID-19 pandemic, they are the eyes and ears of public health and even primary care. So a pediatrician by training, we certainly rely on our nurses a lot and particularly those that uh, interact with the school school environment on a, on a consistent basis. Um, this is these are numbers that came out of the National Association of School Nurses. Um, they, they noted that already over 60% of school nurses have been involved in discussions regarding COVID-19 precautions and plans. A lot of them have a number of critical activities, including 48% answering phone calls directly from parents and the community, 45% educating staff members on COVID-19 prevention strategies, and a number of them helping with medication and updating school health policies. So the goal here is to ensure that we're adequately answering questions that come up from school nurses because they are the fund of knowledge for a good um, number of our school districts and ensuring that um, this, they're kept safe as a group. Next slide, please. NCDHHS has also standardized what the recommended PPE um, that might be available both for nursing and delegated staff in recommended cleaning and hygiene items. And this is just taken directly from the Strong, strong Start um, guidance. So cleaning items include soap, sanitizers, cloth face coverings, and gloves. 
personal protective equipment include face shields, procedural masks, gowns, and gloves. And I think most people already know that these are available, but just ensuring that there's a consistent supply of these items will be a good idea. Next slide, please. And I think this is probably one of our last slides on background. So the advice the school nurses can share are the advice you've already been given. And the advice we'll say we provide to the community at large. So prior to standardizing anything with in-person school, we have to ensure that there's personal responsibility in staying home when you're sick. And this applies to kids, but also to staff members as well. Avoiding touching of our face, covering cuffs and sneezes, and cleaning surfaces on a consistent basis. Um, and including washing your hands before and after cleaning and just before interacting with others. Next slide, please. So, Dr. Akinboyo, the state has advised schools to have a health room in a separate area for COVID-19 symptomatic students and staff. How does, how does staff designate which students should go to the school health room or to the COVID area room? Yes, yeah, so that's a, it's a very good question. I very briefly, can we go to the next slide? Just let me see if we have anything alluding to this. Yes. So I very briefly, briefly alluded to the fact that we may not always know if a child has COVID-19 and we're going into flu season. So there may be many symptoms that a child, show, a child might have that may not be related to COVID-19. And so we don't want to put children that have an illness with children that have COVID-19 and lead to transmission. So what, is, what are ways, what are practical ways we can address this? So students displaying signs of infectious illnesses that are consistent with COVID-19 may include fever or cough, maybe a runny nose, but those that seems less likely. Um, it's important that the, a teacher or staff member excuses the student from a classroom setting. And remember, we're talking about what occurs during in-person schooling. Um, so if there's a cohort or pod, just making sure that child is excused. And that des designated person takes the student to a, an, another designated area. Now, the, these areas can be small. I know a lot of school districts are considering using larger areas, such as an auditorium, um, to assess or evaluate a child that has an illness, because that would allow you to space them out. If a child is comfortable enough to wear a mask, it's important to ensure they keep their mask on even while they're being evaluated and ensure that they're in parallel, their efforts to contact their parent or caregiver so that they can pick them up and seek att attention if needed. If multiple students have to be placed in a room together, just ensure that there is mask, consistent mask use across the board if possible, um, and at least six feet of distance between them. Next slide, please. The CDC has come up with um, even more specifics about how to evaluate kids. We will not go through the entirety of this today, but note that it's available. We'll also include it in our frequently asked questions as a resource, and it can help with divvying up who's sick, who's not sick, and how quickly they need to be seen. Next slide, please. Um, so I'll, I'll ask this one of Dr. Weber. What type of PPE should the school nurse have when managing COVID-19 positive students? Well, first of all, uh, uh, we would hope that school nurse would be only managing a uh, person with symptoms that are consistent with uh, COVID. A, a known COVID patient uh, should be home in isolation uh, for uh, 10 days, at least one day uh, without a fever and with symptoms improved. So. The school nurse really should not be managing known positive uh, patients. But if they're an unknown patient, uh, uh, then you can see here the patient, uh, the student should have a mask on. Uh, the nurse uh, ideally should have at least a mask, preferably uh, potentially an N95 uh, and uh, uh, eye protection as well as uh, gloves. Uh, a gown is useful, but it's not, uh, not key. It's really uh, the eye protection, the mask and the, uh, uh, and the gloves. Uh, there and the mask ideally would be a medical mask, which, uh, in addition to uh, uh, filtering out any particles in the air, uh, would have some uh, fluid resistance as well. And the eye protection could be some type of goggles or a face shield. Thank you. 
Um, Dr. Akinboyo, um, as a school nurse, what should happen when students present to the nurse with symptoms of headache and stomach ache and nausea, but not fever? Should we keep them out of class? Yes, so I think in this current environment, it's hard to say this is definitely COVID, this is definitely flu, this is something else. Of course, we can still see mild illnesses or someone ate something bad that morning, um, but currently the recommendation is to remove a child that's symptomatic, even if it seems mild, so a headache, a stomachache, or nausea out of the classroom and have them evaluated or have a parent or caregiver come and pick them off um, and take them out of the school, in-person school setting. Thank you. So I think this next slide was actually related to that, the bottom question on the last slide that I apparently didn't address, but how do we isolate kids if you have multiple children that have similar symptoms at the same time? The, both the CDC and our state guidance have provided some specifics around establishing a space um, and having this as a designated isolation space for children that are ill. It's not necessarily just COVID related, but ensuring that even if they have COVID-19, they can be seen in that space. So what should those isolation rooms look like? The school should plan to have a room that's designated to isolate students and staff members, um, because unfortunately we do have staff members that could start to have symptoms while at school. Um, if there are, if there's a designated person that can help with evaluating students. So even if it's not the nurse, I know some schools may not have nursing there every day, but even if it's not the school's nurse, there should be a designated person that is assigned as the evaluator for that day for kids that might be ill. You can take that student to the designated area um, until there's a transportation that's been arranged to pick up the student. And as I mentioned before, if there are multiple students that need to be placed in the same area, just ensuring that there's consistent mask use if safe. Next slide, please. So Dr. Weber, for staff who travel between multiple schools, how can we decrease the potential of spreading the virus from one school to another? And if we're in contact with someone who tests positive at one school, and if we've traveled to other schools prior to learning that information, will it be necessary for staff at the other schools to quarantine because you possibly expose them as well? So uh, the answer is to the extent possible, uh, one would like to uh, uh, compartmentalize uh, uh, people moving and intermingling. That increases the risk that if one's positive, there will be more transmission and or certainly more people uh, who would be uh, sent home for a two-week uh, isolation period. And I should say it's uh, uh, not only uh, uh, staff, but it's, you know, contract workers, other people going from uh, school to school. And to the extent possible, one would like to minimize uh, people going into each classroom, again, to the extent possible. So if you had, uh, you know, one uh, teacher who taught uh, whatever typing skills, Instead of going from classroom to classroom, at the extent you could do things virtually uh, and not have multiple people coming in, uh, that would be useful. Uh, beyond that, of course, uh, everybody wearing masks uh, and symptom screening, that is if people have symptoms consistent uh, uh, with uh, COVID, even mild symptoms, they do not come to work that day. They call uh, the an occupational health number uh, and then they go get a COVID test. So that is uh, something that could be, uh, uh, that would be uh, uh, the best way to do that. But certainly people uh, intermingling within a school or traveling between schools uh, does uh, raise uh, uh, concerns of uh, transmission beyond that. And one could obviously see the chain that's occurring uh, uh, in the White House with uh, multiple meetings uh, and multiple infections as an example of people moving among different, uh, uh, different groups. There's no way to entirely eliminate it. Uh, but to the extent you can do things virtually and follow the guidance of physical distancing, mask wearing, and not coming to work ill is the best way to handle it. Great, thank you. So, uh, Dr. Weber, I'll actually ask you this question as well. Why is COVID considered so much more dangerous than the flu than we have seen in more recent years? So there are two reasons. So uh, first, uh, let me point out that uh, uh, with influenza, of course, which uh, does kill a considerable number of people and makes many more sick each year, uh, 
uh, we get a flu shot that decreases, or we can, that decreases our risks. And many of us have at least some partial immunity to influenza because we've had either the flu shot, if not this year and past years, or uh, cases of the flu that provide uh, some protection. Of course, for COVID, 100% of the population was susceptible uh, because uh, it had not been circulating. So that's one issue. Then besides that, it is just a more serious illness. So uh, we track uh, at our hospital the death rate for hospitalized patients due to a viral disease, and it's about the same. Uh, and as you'd expect, older people have higher risks. People with underlying diseases like heart or lung problems have higher risks. But overall, it's in the range at UNC of about 5%. And that includes, by the way, endemic uh, coronaviruses. Our mortality rate, if you were sick enough to come into the hospital uh, with COVID, is in the range of 13 to 15 percent. And hopefully some of the new drugs and other therapies will lower that. But so just within the hospital, it does appear uh, to be about three times more uh, deadly than, the, than influenza. Plus, many more people are obviously susceptible. Both those factors are driving uh, the mortality rate, and as you know, we've had over 200,000 Americans die uh, just since in the last uh, nine months of COVID, which is many more than would die in a year of, uh, of influenza. Thank you. Next slide. So, uh, Dr. Akinboyo, um, there have been a, a number of questions that may pertain actually to this slide. I'm wondering if you might be able to help us distinguish between COVID-19 and other um, symptoms from other illnesses. Yes, absolutely. So I will restate that it's going to be hard to delineate which, in, which symptom is associated with which infection when you're in a school setting and you're trying to screen what is making this child ill today. So in that setting, we do need to have an abundance of caution and preferentially remove a child from the classroom if they have a symptom. But again, we're targeting school nurses today. So we have a few more specifics that may be helpful. And so I'll go through this, the chart on the, my right. And this is, this is just standard information that's been pushed out by the CDC. And just going through stepwise, um, the symptoms that are usually concerning for COVID-19 are on the far left of this chart. They include fever, a cough, a sore throat, shortness of breath, maybe some fatigue, diarrhea, vomiting, runny nose, and body aches. If you're concerned for strep throat, usually they may have a fever, they may have a sore throat, um, may have some GI symptoms, diarrhea and vomiting, so the purple check boxes and some body aches, but should not have shortness of breath, should not be coughing significantly. So if someone says, I have, a, I have strep throat um, and they're coughing, you know those two things don't match, but presumably they should not be in school in person that day. Similarly, and these are things you can also apply in your community as you're talking to others about COVID-19, the typical common cold tends to be a mild illness. Some people may have a cough, sore throat, maybe a runny nose. They may feel a little more rundown than usual. So the lighter blue checks going all the way down um, and they may have some muscle aches, but they don't have high spiking fevers. They're not short of breath and look significantly ill. And then moving on to influenza, I think this is one that's tricky because most of the symptoms associated with influenza are also associated with COVID-19. In this chart, it, it looks like, except shortness of breath, you could argue that some people, if they get um, a severe case of influenza, may get short of breath eventually. One difference, it's a slight difference, is that people with COVID-19 seemingly report more cases of loss of smell and taste. Some people also report it with other viral illnesses. So, uh, we'll just carefully use that to separate out COVID-19 from something else. But clearly influenza can be pretty severe, fever, cough, sore throat, um, the dark blue check marks going all the way down, uh, lots of tiredness, some GI symptoms in some people, and uh, people tend to feel very achy. Now, those are separate from things that are non-infectious, like asthma. And I know if you're in school nursing, uh, you probably have a lot of experience managing acute exacerbations of asthma. Tends to involve cough, shortness of breath, maybe some tiredness, but should not include a fever, uh, runny nose, or diarrhea, vomiting. 
And of course, seasonal allergies. This became the bane of our existence in March and April because a lot of people were in North Carolina and a lot of people have allergies and a lot of people associate their allergies uh, with any symptom they have. The typical symptoms might be a mild runny nose. Some people may have red eyes, so the red checks here. Um, maybe cough, not as common, maybe a sore throat. But in the coronavirus and COVID era, I think it's been hard for people to separate out allergies from symptoms. So if you do have symptoms that you may have thought would be allergies, it may be worth getting that um, tested, that person tested. Thank you. I think actually I'll turn it over to Dr. Um, Benjamin to uh, ask a couple of questions perhaps out of the chat. Great, thanks. Um, the first question, and uh, Dr. Akinwoy, I think you just uh, commented on these, but because they'd come up again, um, if you could just hit one or two quick highlights. How long should children isolate at home in some of the circumstances that you have outlined? Yeah, so we can go through isolation guidance. These are fairly consistent across the board now, although they may change again soon. So if a child is infected, if a child has a positive COVID test, or actually if anybody has a positive COVID test, they are required to isolate in their household for 10 days. And that 10 day timeline came from studies that have shown that you decrease your viral transmission at just about day seven or 10, uh, day seven to nine. So by day 10, we should not be seeing viral spread. Keep in mind the, the 10 day isolation cannot really be shortened for anyone that's positive, even if their symptoms improve. So 10 days after a positive test. I, I don't think it's particularly noted on the slide, but this is just for screening. If a child is exposed, again, if anyone is exposed, they're supposed to quarantine for 14 days from the date of exposure. Ex and exposure is defined as either a household, you live in a household with someone that has COVID-19, or you spend 15 minutes less than six feet um, with someone that eventually got diagnosed with COVID-19. The tricky part here, of course, is that if you're wearing a cloth face mask in, a, in the, if you're applying the state's guidance and wearing a cloth face mask and you're less than six feet, you are required to quarantine after exposure to someone with COVID-19. In some of the settings, some people consider that a low risk exposure, particularly if you're wearing a surgical mask, um, but to reduce any confusion, if you're less than six feet and spend over 15 minutes with someone that is subsequently diagnosed with COVID-19, you're supposed to quarantine at home for 14 days. I think those are the two numbers that we should keep in mind. There are a couple of other things that float around in the healthcare setting about immunocompromised patients, um, but that may be for a different audience. Great, thanks. And then this one may be um, a little, um, I'm gonna skip this one around um, uh, staffing recommendations because that's a little bit uh, out of scope. Maybe we can talk as a team offline uh, about um, school nurses, one full day versus two partial days in a week. That may be um, a little bit out of scope for the, for the ABC team. Um, and then I know you touched on this, but maybe just to hit the highlights again, handling the student with asthma and shortness of breath. So I would assume a child with underlying asthma and who then develops uh, uh, shortness of breath. Do we place a student with shortness of breath due to wheezing in uh, an area that's uh, kind of designated as COVID care for our school? In our current environment, I, I would say yes. I think depending on what additional support you have to provide for that, uh, that child, it would be important to care for them where you're caring for others that might be ill. It would be a good idea to separate them out from others. And so if, for example, you do have to provide a nebulizer treatment to someone that became suddenly ill, it would be good to have a separate room separate from others because a nebulizer can have some splash or aerosol generated with it. It's very minimal and not, not a main form of transmission. And because we don't know if an infection is causing that asthma exacerbation, it may be good to see them separately. 
But if it's just an asthma exacerbation, you need to monitor them. They get a couple of puffs of an inhaler. They can be in the same setting as others that might be ill, ensuring that they stay six feet away from others. And for the children that can still wear a mask, they should keep their mask on. Okay. And this one, um, this, uh, well, because uh, nurses are assigned to multiple schools, are there recommendations for the school day when the nurse is not at school? And, so I think uh, Dr. Weber Dr. addressed this earlier, um, just to make sure I understand the question. It's likely if you need to evaluate a student and the school nurse is not present, um, are there recommendations for that setting? And I think and I'm grateful we were able to interact with the school leaders as well. Um, but I think having a designated person for one day, it may not necessarily be the school nurse, but ensuring that there is someone that's assigned to the role of evaluating students that may get sick in school would be part of a standard protocol as we go into in-person schooling. So I, I, my comments on that would be obviously whoever is doing the evaluation has to have some medical training. So there are several ways to do that. One is we're increasingly Duke, UNC, all the hospitals telemedicine. So one could work out a system where either the school nurse could do it uh, virtually through telemedicine. There obviously has to be an adult in the room supervising, uh, but uh, you could do it through a telemedicine approach. Uh, ultimately, uh, the other options, if the child is mildly ill, is simply to call the parents to pick up the child, or if the child appears to be in any chance of distress, then obviously you would call 911 and have uh, the paramedics uh, come and evaluate the child. Uh, but to me, the simple and easiest thing would be to work out some telemedicine approach. And um, Dr. Weber, just to follow, that, follow up on that, um, clearly with children who are becoming symptomatic um, uh, with uh, concerns for um, COVID-19, that's, um, that's for pickup. Uh, from parents, uh, but uh, if to make that assessment uh, initially, um, has uh, telemedicine um, school to school, another advantage of that be to uh, reduce the amount of exposure of staff traveling uh, school to school, which I think might be appealing um, for uh, some schools. So if you could kind of give a little more uh, details, if you have them, about your um, experience there, that would be great. So, yes, uh, we've been using telemedicine widely uh, for internal medicine, family practice, uh, pediatrics. Of course, the very simplest is just like we are, a simple screen, and uh, uh, obviously somebody uh, 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 then guiding someone through an evaluation, and of course the healthcare provider can talk directly to the ill person and get a history. You can certainly get more sophisticated uh, with uh, having things, simple things like uh, an example would be an electronic stethoscope that somebody uh, could put on someone's chest that then would allow somebody like I'm sitting here with, I don't have my headphones in, but uh, Danny uh, has his headphones in, that they could actually listen to the heartbeat and the respirations, those new uh, devices that hook up into an electronic format are not uh, particularly expensive. And, and they get increasingly sophisticated there. Uh, but uh, the ones that are available can do things like respiration, pulse, uh, allow people to do a blood pressure, uh, or you could get an automatic blood pressure uh, machine, which are inexpensive. Uh, so all of those things could uh, uh, get at least an initial evaluation as to how sick a person was uh, through telemedicine. Great. Uh, Dr. Ackerman Boyle, I think this one might be for you, Ibikin. Uh What about the students who are nonverbal or cannot express uh, verbally discomfort or illness? And so, just pushing that question onwards is. Uh, question probably trying to address how do you determine if they're ill um, and then also how do you manage it if they are ill so i think for children that cannot express themselves again educators are well versed in assessing a child's need um, but if there's a change from baseline 
most kids, particularly the chronic kids, have a baseline function that they can do in terms of interacting or what they look like. And if that changes, that could be the first sign that something is wrong. Um, in terms of how to care for that child, because the child might, might not be able to wear a mask or wash their hands as needed, there may be some modifications that are needed, such as using a wipe to wipe their hands down and for the staff to wear additional, what we've called previously enhanced protective equipment, um, which would include gowns, gloves, a face shield or eye protection and a surgical mask. David, I think uh, this one for you, what about uh, staff and or students who travel out of the country? Should they isolate before returning to school? You know, uh, at the moment, uh, there are very few countries in the world that have higher rates of uh, COVID than the United States. Uh, so uh, the answer in general would be no. Uh, but the risk uh, to me is not so much going to a country unless you went to I mean, really, the outbreaks besides the United States, the other hotspots are Brazil uh, and uh, uh, India. Certainly, the rates are going up in Europe, and they're, uh, you know, we're still higher than them, but they're approaching us. The risk of the travel is less where you go than how you get there and what you do. So there is some risk uh, being on a plane, and certainly if you go to another country, and then you, why would you go if you're just going to sit in a hotel room, you're eating in restaurants and doing other activities? that puts you uh, at, uh, uh, at risk. Uh, right now, at least at the University of North Carolina, we are not allowed as uh, 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 members of the university to travel out of state on official business. Uh, we don't have a particular policy that requires me to uh, uh, automatically uh, uh, stay home for two weeks when I return. Uh, but that was a decision would be made by uh, individual counseling with occupational health, looking at the risks I may have encountered while I was traveling. Great. Uh, and then could you, um, I, I think you touched on this maybe in a previous uh, webinar, but could you address, and David, this is to you, um, could you address later symptoms associated with COVID-19 in the second or third week? And are those symptoms relatively uncommon in children? So maybe untwining adults and children here. Well, let me start off first with adults. And uh, the answer is uh, there are at least one study I'm aware of in uh, uh, adults who had mild disease, never hospitalized, and four or five studies in hospitalized patients. So the older you are, the more underlying diseases you have, and the sicker you were, the more likely you are to have symptoms after you've had your recovery uh, from, uh, from COVID. But even people who have had mild disease defined as symptomatic but not requiring hospitalization uh, will have symptoms that last for weeks to months and 30% of the time. And those symptoms tend to be what you'd find with COVID itself, uh, uh, shortness of breath, uh, cough, fatigue, uh, muscle aches. Fever, by the way, is not a continuing symptom. So somebody who's recovered from COVID and either has a prolonged fever or a new fever, that's an indication to seek uh, medical care. For older individuals, uh, things like uh, uh, mental confusion, uh, more difficulty thinking, uh, and other more subtle signs are also uh, possible, and UNC is developing a multi-specialty post-care clinic. But I've talked to my colleagues in pediatrics around the country, and they're at, uh, at this point, there is absolutely no data on children that I know of. Now, again, there are 60,000 published papers. I don't know, I've missed something. But you know, I'm not aware of studies looking at a child who had COVID uh, either asymptomatically or symptomatically. And of course, it would be by age to see six months, uh, three months, six months, do they have more difficulties in school? Do they, does it precipitate uh, learning disabilities? Do they have more problems interacting with children of their own age? Are there behavioral issues uh, uh, there? underlying problems like shortness of breath. It's something I think just absolutely crying out for good studies, but it just, there isn't data uh, to answer that question. Great. And then uh, uh, Eva, can I think this one is uh, for you around the why quarantine for 10 days in one situation and 14 days in another. And I think this relates to uh, testing and the pre-symptomatic uh, phase, but 
if you could clarify that, why the differential in the 10 versus 14? Yes, so the repeating the first of all what the isolation is. So someone that's positive today is isolated for 10 days from today. The reason behind that is we have we've had a lot more studies about how this virus spreads and how long you shed when you're positive. Yes, you can spread the first probably two, three days prior to showing symptoms. You start showing symptoms, you can spread for the next just about five to seven days. Some have pushed out to, I think the longest we've seen in a normal healthy host is about nine days. However, you can find viral fragments for weeks and weeks and weeks. They're just not live viruses that can spread. So that's where the 10 days comes from. The CDC has said a normal healthy host or a normal healthy person that gets this infection was likely shed in a few days before we realized they had the infection and then will likely not be shed in or spread in the virus at about day 10. That's where the isolation comes up. However, if I'm exposed, so I don't have the infection yet, but I'm exposed to someone that has the infection, it takes a little while for the virus to replicate. So the virus has to grow enough in your body to then lead to symptoms, or for some people, even if they don't have symptoms, to mount enough of the viral particles that they can spread it. And so that timeline, it's about two to five days for most people, but I think it, it does extend to that two week point. And so that's where the 14 day comes from, which is when you're exposed, we have to wait about 14 days to be safe that you are not infected and you're not going to spread it to other people, whether you realize it or not. I think we that often leads to a question about why don't you just test and then end your quarantine because then you know you don't have it. But as we've said in other webinars, you can't test your way out of a quarantine. I think Dr. Weber said this best during our last one because a test is just a snapshot in time. Sure, you can get tested today after an exposure and you're negative, but that does not mean you don't have the infection tomorrow or the day after and can still spread. So longer duration after exposure, because there's a potential your infection could start later. After you've been infected, so shorter duration, because we have a lot of studies that have tested, have counted the number of days people are shedding viruses, and we have a better sense of that. I mentioned this very briefly before, I will say it again, I, I, so if people are immunocompromised, so for example, if you're talking about a child with cancer, that duration is a bit longer. I didn't want to confuse things. I'm not tossing out too many numbers, um, but that's double the typical duration for a normal healthy person. Great, thanks. Uh, Dr. Zimmerman? Sure. Um, Dr. Rekomboyo, I wonder if you might um, readdress the issue of testing specifically around kids who may have kids or staff members who may have symptoms and then go for a test and then have a negative test. Tell us about when they might be able to come back and contrast that potentially with what you just said about exposure. Yes, um, it's hard to target all of those different reasons why people might be symptomatic. So if they're symptomatic after an exposure, they should get tested for COVID-19. Even if they're negative, I think this is where things are a little tricky because if you've been exposed to someone with COVID-19, you get tested, even if you're negative, for the most part, people still wait out their quarantine period because there's a chance you could still have COVID-19. So you wait out your 14 days, no matter what. If you have a symptom from something else, um, someone might have a bad GI bug or may actually have influenza, hopefully not if people get vaccinated and stay away from those that are sick. Um, in, the, in that context, I think we can revert back to what we typically do. A lot of school districts already had protocols around when to return to school while ill. So if it's not COVID-19, it's some other illness, it's resolved most often within 24 hours, you can return to a school setting, in-person school setting. So for those, I would say we can revert back to the standard schools protocol around managing children that are ill. Thank you. Dr. Weber, I was wondering if you might be able to um, talk specifically and provide some clarification on the PPE that nurses potentially would be wearing. For example, when is it appropriate for them to wear a face mask um, and what type of mask underneath potentially a face mask, sorry, when is it appropriate to wear a face shield and then um, what type of mask should they be wearing as well? 
So specifically for school nurses who are dealing with uh, ill uh, individuals. So first of all, ideally the student who's ill has a mask on properly fitted and so should the, uh, uh, so should the nurse. If the uh, individual, uh, particularly if the uh, student who's ill cannot or will not wear a mask, then the, uh, in that case, the uh, school nurse needs to be wearing eye protection, goggles or a face shield, either one works. Uh, but it has to be a, a true face shield or goggles. Regular uh, glasses like I'm wearing now are not adequate uh, to protect the eye. So in those cases, it's clearly uh, mandatory that they would wear that. Uh, I should say, if they were doing any cough-inducing procedure, which they in general would not be uh, at, a, uh, uh, at a school, then they clearly, uh, regardless of whether the person's masked or not, they, couldn't, uh, they would uh, need to be wearing uh, a mask and a uh, uh, and a uh, and a face shield, and of course, if the uh, child is spitting or there's any saliva or liquids, then they should be, regardless uh, of what the child has, COVID or not COVID, they should be protecting their eyes with goggles or a, a face shield. Uh, then, uh, since it's obviously you don't know what's going to happen, uh, and you can't go grabbing for your face shield uh, if the child yanks off his mask for whatever reason, they're sick. Uh, having shortness of breath or uh, coughing too hard, it, it's just more prudent to always wear it with a sick child uh, eye protection. Great, thank you. Dr. Akinboyo, I was wondering if you might um, speak to medical reasons for children to not wear a mask. For example, is asthma a reason? So the medical reason for a child to not wear a mask may not exist yet. So we may have to banter on what the specific medical reason is. I think for adults, there's some we've, we've mentioned quite, and maybe some complicated kids may not be able to comply. Although I will say in the hospital, we've had children, even those that may have a trach, may require some oxygen for a little bit or chronically um, or developmentally delayed, come into the hospital and wear a mask even for a prolonged duration of time. That being said, there may be some reasons, uh, but asthma is not one of them. I think if a child is acutely symptomatic, so if a child is having an acute asthma exacerbation, in that context, I certainly would not want anything over their face to help with evaluating them and of course, providing support. But during the normal course of the day, most children should be more than able to safely comply with um, mask wearing. As we mentioned before, younger children who cannot safely remove a mask by themselves, usually it's about the two to three years of age, um, are excluded from most of this mask mandates. Um, but all of the older kids, even with prior illness, even with chronic disease, should be able to comply with mask wearing. For developmental, for children with some developmental delays, some have opted to or, or may have some sensory disorders. Some have opted to use face shields. And then of course, there's some that really will not tolerate anything on their face, um, not because it's of a medical reason, but more for some developmental concerns. And in those cases, we have additional recommendations for the staff members that have to interact with them. And in this context, at least right now, their virtual learning options for a lot of students if they have a lot of issues with PPE. Great, thank you. Maybe one more question for you, Dr. Akinboya, and then I'll turn it back over to Dr. Benjamin. So um, when returning to an in-person school setting, how can we prevent outbreaks? And can you maybe contrast um, secondary transmission cases within the, with cases within the school um, related to outbreaks? So how can we prevent outbreaks? Um, I think that's separate from how can we prevent cases in school. So preventing outbreaks in school will go back to a lot of things you've already been a part of as people that are um, key players in the school, school plan, school policies. Um, and all it has to do is having set protocols that involve mask wearing, distance between kids, between the staff members and kids, um, and washing hands and cleaning surfaces um, on a scheduled basis during or after the school day. That prevents spread within the school. However, if we have cases in the community, as we're seeing today, if in your household, if people are um, going to large events or having other areas in the community where people are gathering and spreading infections, 
we all live in community, so we may see cases, but the, the way you know your plans are working is even if you have one or two cases or a few more isolated cases, but you don't see spread amongst their, con their contacts, then you know that we're not seeing school-based clusters or school-based secondary transmission. So that's where that secondary transmission comes in. We will see cases. If we have cases in the community, it would not be zero in schools. Those two things are linked. The schools are part of communities. Even if we have one case in the community, there's a potential you could have a case in school. But with all of the guidelines, all of the set protocols, we should not see spread from that one case in the school setting. So I hope that addressed it. I can't overstate, and I know I've said it many times, if we have community cases, we'll have school cases. We shouldn't see school spreads if we follow all the protocols. Sorry, just to follow up on that, can you maybe provide um, some examples from other states where things have gone well? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, we often remember the cases where things did not go well. So I think a lot of people have alluded to the uh, camps in Georgia and a lot of what we've talked about were not followed in those camps. Um, however, um, Rhode Island being one of them, um, they've, they, and I'm referring to states that have also published their data. Um, so there is a CDC paper around the experience in Rhode Island where daycare centers and kids were in congregate settings, not necessarily school settings. Um, and there were a few cases noted um, as their community prevalence went up and down, but they did not see any secondary cases. So no school-based transmission, even though they noted cases. And then I will say in North Carolina, we've also, I know we have a long list of school-based clusters, but we've actually seen a lot of success um, among schools and summer camps. We've had quite a few summer camps that were open for about three months during the height of the pandemic. And a number of them did not report secondary cases, even though they had a few cases amongst the children. Over to you, Danny. Danny, we can't hear you. Thanks, Misha. Sorry about that. So uh, what, uh, David, what type of mask should a school nurse wear, cloth, medical grade, or N95? I know your, the group over there at UNC has done some high quality work around uh, different types of masks. Can you retouch on that, please? When yeah. assessing a symptomatic student in the school setting? So uh, ideally, the, the nurse would wear at least a medical grade mask because uh, we know if it's a uh, uh, declared a medical grade mask. It has a uh, certain uh, fit capability as well as a um, uh, as well as a filtering capacity. And I should say you can improve the fit of many masks just by a simple little uh, hair clip or device that uh, fits uh, behind the head and pulls the mask a little tighter. And we use those in the hospital. They cost about a penny a piece, and they're uh, reusable. Uh, Ideally, your nurse would be in a fit-tested N95 respirator because the, the uh, symptomatic person in North Carolina at the present time has about a 10% chance roughly of having COVID. That could go up or it could go down as, uh, as we, uh, uh, during respiratory season. So ideally, they'd be in a fit-tested N95 uh, respirator. But if they, if they had not been fit-tested properly, which you need to be, they come in different sizes, you need to know how to put it on then uh, a uh, uh, eye protection or face shield uh, plus a, uh, a medical grade mask should be sufficient to prevent any risk to the, uh, to the nurse. Great, thanks. And this is uh, to your point, uh, David, re really reemphasizes the state's emphasis on documenting uh, no symptoms uh, prior to uh, coming to school and uh, not sending children uh, with symptoms uh, to uh, school. Um, one um, item that's kind of a re-question that um, I'll go ahead and take on, and uh, which is how should we handle students who continually pull down their own face coverings? In the mainstream curriculum, in the mainstream population, no mask, no school. No mask, no going into large gatherings with other people, close up, face to face. School is no different than anywhere else. 
uh, in the adaptive curriculum, it's a very different uh, situation. It's a more nuanced situation. And that, those data and that information had uh, an hour long webinar that's been uh, previously posted uh, on the uh, uh, ABC website. And this goes back to uh, Dr. Akinboyo's point about uh, from a medical, strictly medical perspective, such as a diagnosis of asthma, um, we, we don't have such a reason. That's in contrast to the children with substantial special needs who are in the adaptive curriculum that have a multi-factorial uh, process going on um, and requires a much more nuanced and individualized uh, approach and support for those um, teachers, staff, uh, children, and uh, families. Um, with that, uh, Dr. Zimmerman, I believe we're coming right up to the top of the hour. And uh, as usual, uh, Kanisha, you'll have the uh, last word tonight. Thanks, Danny. Um, we really enjoyed spending time with you guys as usual. Um, we are excited every week to have you and um, looking forward to spending more time um, over the course of the next several weeks. I hope that you have a great week and uh, we will see you next week. Have a good night. Good night.